And now, with no further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker, Tim Walsh. Uh, Tim is a game designer, author, filmmaker, and professional speaker. The games that he's designed or co-designed have sold over seven million copies all over the world. He's written three books which have been praised by the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, and NPR. The films that he's co-produced or co-directed have won Best Documentary awards in three US film festivals. His lectures on the value of play, creativity, and connection are the culmination of a 28-year career as an entrepreneur. Please welcome Tim Walsh. Thank you, Michael. How are you doing this morning? You ready for some fun? Yeah. Okay, good. I have a weird question to ask to begin with. Do you like peas? No, some, I heard a no. Hopefully you're going to like peas before we're done this morning because I'm gonna ask some questions and if you are able to answer correctly, I'm going to launch a pea into the crowd like this. Nice! Very, very good job, there we go. Okay, so if you answer correctly, I'm gonna shoot a pea your way. I, I, I'm trusting you all to get the pea to the person who answered correctly. Now you may ask yourself, why would I want to collect a pea? It's because if you have a pea at the end of this presentation, you can bring it up here and win a new car wash certificate. No, you can't win that. You can win a game that I designed or co-designed, maybe a film that I co-produced or co-directed if you catch a pea, but you have to answer correctly first. So here we go. What do these three things have in common? The Navy, SeaWorld, and a Ziploc bag. The Navy SEALs! Oh, good catch. Very good. Okay, here's another one. A period, a question, and parole. The end of a sentence. Yes! <clears throat> Very good. How about a hobby store, a fashion show, and a car dealership? A hobby store, a fashion show, and a car deal. Models! I heard it over here. All right. I'm pretty good at shooting these. This is pretty cool. Okay. A beehive, a chess set, and England. Queen. Oh, boy. Who got that first? I don't know. Over here, someone's being honest. Okay. There you go. All right. Last one. Here we go. What do these three have in common? A rookie, the Incredible Hulk, and an envious person. Green. Green. I heard it on the left-hand side here. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Very good, you play, very good, very good. Give yourself a round of applause there, very nice. I'm fighting a cold, I'm gonna power through. So, 28 years ago, some friends of mine and I from college went to the Jacob Javits Center in New York City to the largest trade show in the world for toys and games called Toy Fair. And it was a very rough start to the launch of this game that we invented. Now, it's one thing to create something. It's another to take money from someone and then create something. We had investors, and we were not spending their money very wisely. Because as you can see from our booth, we had purple velvet drapes. <laughs> <clears throat> and we were launching the game that you just played, Tribond. Purple, vel purple, purple velvet is expensive. It, it's expensive to then sew it into drapes, and then find out that you need to make it fire retardant and have it treated. Very expensive. We had, oh, sorry. I jumped ahead there. There we go. We had uh, hand-painted columns, glass tables, and yes, that's an actual marble floor. We hand-carried marble into a trade show. $10,000 we spent. Now, there's just a couple things about marble you should know. Uh, you probably already know this. We didn't because we're idiots. Marble's really heavy, 400-pound boxes of marble, right? Uh, the second thing is it's really hard. Toy Fair was a seven-day show back then, so that meant from 9 a.m. to 5 a.m. for seven days with dress shoes on, we stood on marble. We almost had to amputate at the end of the trade show. And then lastly, you may not know this, if you don't grout you know, marble, you just lay it on the floor and put a frame around it, it tends to break. So we're playing the game with people. What do a car, a tree, and an elephant have in common? <coughs> There's 10 bucks out the window. End of the first day, we had sold seven games, excuse me, we had sold seven games and broke 
nine tiles. By the end of the trade show, we had broken more tiles than we had sold games. We sold 48 games and broke 52 tiles. It was a rough start. So I share this with you because creating is difficult. It's hard, right? You fail all the time. I was talking to a friend of mine. We actually produced this film together, Peggy Brown. She's a genius. And I was saying, you know, people are afraid to create because they're afraid to fail. And she said, well, actually, when you think about it, the moment you create, you fail. So what do these three have in common? A blank canvas, a blank computer screen, an empty notepad. No credit for this one. They're perfect. They're pristine. The moment you stroke that canvas with paint, the moment you stroke that key, the moment you stroke that pad with an idea, in essence, you ruin it. You destroy it. You destroy the perfection of it. That freed me up because you know you're going to fail. If you know you're going to fail, then go ahead and fail fast. Fail quickly and move on, right? <clears throat> so let's look at the... I apologize. Look at the definition for creativity. It is a process of having original ideas that have value. I got this definition from an uh, educator named Ken Robinson, who I love. So let's look at value first. Ideas have to have value. And people don't like that because... Value is subjective, but it's important. Creativity needs to have value, and it does. A study by IBM asked 1,500 CEOs what the most important thing, quality, to have in a leader, and more than business acumen, more than uh, knowledge of the industry they're in, and by the way, they asked these people from 60 different countries in 33 different industries, and the number one answer was creativity. That's what you need as a leader. So why create? I believe we create for three reasons. We create to move ourselves and others. We create to communicate ideas. And we create to solve problems. Now, do people create for reasons other than these three? Of course, all the time. But I contend that in order to do your best creative work, you need to keep these three things in mind. For instance, say you have a client and you have a, a big party, an event happening, it's gonna be really big. You've got shrimp and live pigeons and John Stamos is coming. This is a big party, right? You have to do a press release. You ask yourself, why am I doing this press release? And if your answer is, well, we always do a press release before a big event. Probably not gonna be your most creative work if that's your answer. If your answer to why am I doing this press release is, well, it's been on my to-do list for three weeks, and I gotta get it done because I've been putting it off. Again, probably not your best work. You wanna focus on, on all three of these because if you focus on one, say for instance, you do number two really well. You communicate the what, where, when, why of this event very clearly, but you don't move anybody. Then they're not gonna show up to this event. You also may trick yourself and say, well, I got this stupid thing off my to-do list, so therefore, I solved a problem. You solved a problem, it's off your to-do list. You didn't solve the problem, which is getting people to come to the event. So you can see by using that example, by talking through those points and asking yourself those questions, it can boost your creativity. So creativity hack number one is focus on why. Why are you creating the thing that you're trying to create? And keep those three things in mind. So let's go back to the first word that I highlighted in this, and that's the word process. How many people, by a show of hands, think they're non-creative? They would say, I am not creative at all. Anybody? Good, oh, one, two, okay. For those that think you're not creative, let me ask, or non-creative, like zero creativity, have you ever made a sandwich? <laughs> Did you pick your clothes this morning? Have you ever been driving and decided, oh, I forgot that thing, and you do a U-turn? We create all the time. We just don't realize that we create all the time. I believe we were created to create, right? So we're all creators. And here's the reason why people have that notion. It's this idea that really creative people have perfectly formed, beautiful ideas that pop into their head, ready to execute. It just never happens, ever happens. Creativity is a process, it's not a point in time. 
I talk to a lot of creative people, and they tell me there's a real perseverance to their best creative work because they have to push through obstacles. So I love documentary films. I made a couple. I watched this one last week, and I was like, oh my gosh, that's perfect. So Steven Tyler, if you don't know, is a rock singer for Aerosmith, and he was going to do a country album. And before he put one stroke on the key, before he wrote one lyric on the pad, he got all kinds of flack. Why are you making a country album? That's not your, stay in your lane, that's not your lane. And he said this, which I love. Some people would rather be certain and miserable than take a risk and be happy. Isn't that great? Think about that for like two weeks. Fear is the reason we don't take chances and don't push limits when it comes to creativity. My favorite TED talk of all time, excuse me if you haven't seen it, you need to check it out. It's by the guy who uh, defined creativity for us, Ken, uh, Ken Robinson. It's called Do Schools Kill Creativity? And he tells a story of a, a kid in a classroom who wasn't paying attention, wasn't a really good student. Um, but then one day they did a drawing exercise and she was in the back of the class diligently drawing and the teacher was like, wow, this is a, a big change. I'm going to find out what's going on. So the teacher went to her and said, Susie, what, what are you drawing? And the little kid said, I'm drawing God. And the teacher kind of laughed and said, well, no one knows what God looks like. And she said, well, they will in a minute. <laughs> Why do we love this story? Because Susie hasn't discovered her fear yet. She's fearlessly confident, which is pretty cool. Creativity hack number two ties into this, and it is persist. Persist. If you want to do your best creative work, whether you consider yourself a total non-creative or not very creative, or you're uber creative, persist. So after our rather unfortunate launch of our game, uh, we found out that we didn't know what we didn't know. It's not an order writing show, thank God for that. Because orders started to trickle in and we persisted and sold it out of the trunks of our cars and signed games at fairs and uh, changed the game a couple times, which was important because after all, that box looks like a cologne bottle. Doesn't look very fun. The subtitle was the uproarious game of connecting cute of connect, I can't even say it. The uproarious game of connecting clues and strategic moves. Wow, that sounds like fun, doesn't it? Uh, we changed that eventually and it kind of looked like this. And I had a vision, I had an idea. This was before Ellen, before Jimmy Fallon. I thought everyone that plays this game likes it. People that don't hear the game don't buy it. It's just sitting on the shelf. How do I get people to play this game? How do I get a national TV show to play this game? I sent so copies out to all kinds of producers. I was diligent. I kept calling them. Most of them hung up on me. But one producer, we sort of clicked. I ended up sending her three games because the first game eventually disappeared. And I would call her and she'd say, well, it's not here anymore. But please don't send another one because we're not going to play it. And I was like, yeah, but you, you need to have it. You know, it's like a ball on your desk. You never know when you need a little stress relief. And she said, well, it is fun, so send me another game. Eventually. She called me and she said, no promises. We had a segment cancel. No promises, but watch tomorrow. And this happened. All morning long, we've been playing this game called uh, Tri Bond, which asks you what do three things have in common? And we've been messing around with it in the studio this morning. I asked about uh, a duck, Congress, and Hillary Rodham Clinton. Bills. bills. They all have bills, yeah, bills, right? You probably got that, right? So this is a game. A fellow named Tim Walsh came up with this game. Kind of neat. You got yeah. some? Yeah. What do these things have in common? The brain, the lung, and the ear. They all have lobes. Oh, oh Gibson, lobes. you're on a roll. Gosh. How about this one? A toy store, a lingerie store, the Kennedy family. Mm. I'm have, not touching that one. They all have teddies. Oh. oh. Here's they one for teddies. you. <laughs> Penguin, kiwi, and ostrich. Birds. Oh, no, 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 not just birds. Australian. Uh, flightless no. birds. Flightless oh. birds. that don't right. fly. Breast, side, back. Strokes. Uh, strokes and swirls. Strokes. Baseball games, trash dumps, blue jeans. Baseball games, trash dumps, blue jeans. Runs. They all have flies. Flies. Close. <laughs> <laughs> 
you get the idea. They played it. What you don't see is every commercial break, they exited with a question. They came back from the break, gave the answer. All told, they played it for four minutes. In 1992, if you were to buy that time, it would be $250,000 for 30 seconds, basically $2 million in free ad, really. And more than that, an endorsement, because they were having fun. Because we had an idea and persisted. Persistence is the second hack. So no matter where you are on the creativity scale, this persist idea can really help because I contend that people that aren't creative try something, they say, I'm just not creative, and they give up. And that's why it doesn't work. People that are ultra creative, same thing. They persist, they fail to persist, rather, because they are so good at generating ideas that they generate and they just move on to the next thing. If you want to improve your creative output, what you want to do is persist. I contend that non-creatives stop out of ignorance, and ultra-creative people stop out of arrogance, right? No matter where you are on the scale. <clears throat> but here's the thing that kills creativity, a lack of focus. Some people stop because they just get distracted, right? We have to focus, and that's never been harder in the history of mankind. We all have post-it note overload. Every one of us in this room is one ping, bing, ding, bing away from interruption, right? And those things kill creativity. So this is what you need to do. Number three, create boundaries of space and time. I got this idea from John Cleese from Monty Python fame. He's a prolific writer. So a boundary of uh, space could look like a sign on your door. You know, it says, welcome, have a nice day. But when you flip it over, it says, working, please do not disturb. And a boundary of space can look like a lot of things. It can look like a park bench, as long as you're not interrupted. It can look like a hammock, as long as you're not interrupted. The best boundary of space in the world, a deserted island, is pointless if your cell phone goes off <laughs> and interrupts you, right? Why you would have cell phone reception in a deserted island, I don't know, but it ruins the story. So you'd get the point. Now, a boundary of time is a little trickier. It seems like, well, that's obvious. You know, 3 o'clock, I'm going to do this thing. I write it on my calendar. Done. You need an end time. This is something I missed. You need, I'm going to start at 3. I'm going to end at 3.20. Writing down that 3.20 or scheduling that 3.20 creates a deadline, creates urgency, and it's amazing how that little thing can really help you. When you set a boundary of time, set the start date, but set the end date as well, the, when it, the point that it's going to end. And if you're able to set a boundary of space, and if you're able to set a boundary of time, you might be able to achieve something called flow, which is creativity hack number four. Find flow, <clears throat> not her. She's easy to find. She's everywhere. We don't need any help finding flow. We need help finding this kind of flow. This is from uh, a Hungarian psychologist named Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. And he says that flow is a state of optimal experience and heightened focus when you're stretched to your limits in a voluntary effort to accomplish something difficult and worthwhile. That's the technical definition. But when people enter flow, and then come out of it, they never say, wow, that was an optimal experience. They say things like this, I was on a roll. A musician might say, I was in the zone, or an athlete who can't miss, right? Runner's high if you're a marathoner. I was locked in, you know? Other musicians might say, I was in the groove. I just was un unconscious, nothing I did. Uh, felt normal. It just was, I was locked in, in the groove. I felt unconscious. A writer who everything she writes just seems to fit right in place says everything just worked. This is flow. So by a show of hands, who here has experienced this? Most of you. Great. So wouldn't it be cool to enter this at will? That's what I'm looking for. That would be really cool. So let's look a little bit closer at flow. Flow is intense focus. Everything else disappears. You're focused on that thing and that thing only. Secondly, there's a diminished sense of self. This is cool. So for those of you that raised your hand, you've probably experienced this. You're in flow, you forget to eat. You forget to sleep. Your brain stops telling you you're hungry. You should go get a muffin. 
You are so locked in that you forget to eat, you forget to sleep. That's a diminished sense of self. But for some of us, myself included, who has critical parts of the back of our evil brain, primordial brain, the diminished, self, the diminished sense of self is great because your inner critic is silenced. It's like a Vulcan nerve pinch to your inner critic, right? That voice in the back of your head is just killed when you're in flow because you lose yourself. That's the best part for me. There's a deep effortless involvement, even though, as we saw in our definition, it's a difficult thing that you're working on. It seems effortless. Time is altered. You're working for 30 minutes, you look up at the clock, it's three hours. How did that happen? Your sense of time is diminished. <clears throat> and finally, there's a sense of control when you're in flow. Now, if you're like me, when you first heard this list, there's some contradictions here. We have intense focus. Oh, my. Yeah, here we go. Intense focus. Doesn't that contradict losing track of time? Or if you lose yourself, how can you have a sense of control? It doesn't seem to make sense. Well, an author named Steve Kotler looked into this, and he wired the brains of musicians, jazz musicians, wired their brain while they went into flow and played with other musicians, and they found something really interesting. The prefrontal cortex, the part of your brain right up front, quieted when you entered flow. It calmed down, and it's interesting what this part of your brain Controls, it controls planning. So you can't get ahead of yourself when you're in flow. You can't second guess the steps that you just made when you're in flow. Pretty cool. Emotion is suppressed in flow. So you don't get too excited, you don't get angry. I think of people that are really talented um, athletes. They're calm as can be when they're between the lines and then they go to the sidelines and blow up and get all emotional and then they go on the court or the field and then they calm again because their emotions are suppressed when they're in flow. And one guess as to where in our brain we process time, the prefrontal cortex. So it makes sense that flow works in this way. So musicians are one, and Kotler and his researchers wanted to find out, are there other people that enter flow at will? And there are extreme sport athletes. And that makes sense, right? Because if you're this woman and you're going 40 miles an hour downhill, you need a sense of control. Right? If you're this guy and you're free climbing, which is climbing without ropes, 200 feet above the canyon floor, the last thing you need is an inner critic. Right? You're, you're reaching for a foothold like this guy is, and there's a, a voice in the back of your head saying, I don't think you're going to reach it. <laughs> Not needed. Don't need that voice. And if you're this guy, 250 feet above an arena floor with a 600 pound dirt bike over your head, you better be focused. No one in this position has ever had their mind wander. Doesn't happen, you know, I wonder what we're having for lunch. <laughs> Doesn't happen. Extreme athletes find focus, they find a way to silence their inner critic, or end, they find a way to control what they're doing, or they find themselves in the hospital, or worse, right? The stakes are dire. Now, the stakes for us aren't as high, but the rewards are the same. There's exhilaration when you create something impactful, that's meaningful, that's purposeful, right? You have that exhilaration. You have that sense of awe, that sense of creating something that maybe is bigger than you. So the benefits are the same if the rewards, or the risk, rather, is not as high. So let's look at finding flow. How do we find flow? The first two we talked about, boundary of space and a boundary of time. The third is you need clear, realistic goals. We know now that you get a hit of dopamine when you reach a goal, feel good chemical. Problem is your brain is stupid. It doesn't know if your goal is worthwhile or not. And that's why you get a hit of dopamine when someone likes your puppy photo on Instagram. So whether you set a really worthwhile goal or a silly goal, you still get the dopamine hit. And that's why to ask yourself, why am I doing this, is so important, because your brain is stupid. Right? So clear, realistic goals. If you do that, you, get, you create a feedback loop, because you get the hit of dopamine, you reach a goal. You get a hit of dopamine, you reach a goal, and you need that feedback as the next part 
of flow. You need immediate feedback to know that you're on the right track. And finally, and this is not intuitive, the challenge level of what you're working on needs to be greater than or equal to your skill level. This is really interesting. I want to spend a little time on this. So this is the challenge skill ratio by Csikszentmihalyi. You can see that the challenge is the vertical access and the skill is the horizontal access. So say you learn something new, you learn how to play the piano. Your skill level is really low. You're gonna do something really challenging like play Beethoven's Fifth on a live television show. You're gonna be up here and feel great anxiety because your skill level does not match what you're doing. Now, if your skill level's low and the challenge is low, you might feel apathetic. So you see how this works. This is where we wanna be in flow. Makes sense. Here's the huge takeaway that I wish I'd learned 10 years ago. As you improve in your career and you get better at what you're doing, think about when you first were really excelling at your career. The challenge was really high. You were learning new stuff and you were pushing into flow. What happens is, as your skills improve, is you fall down here into control. Now there's nothing wrong with control. It feels good to be in control. If you keep sliding, you're in relaxation. Again, nothing wrong with that. But if you want to do your best creative work, you need to challenge yourself to push yourself back into flow because people don't realize this because control feels good. I'm in control. But really, you need to be pushing yourself a lot harder if you want to enter flow on a regular basis. I want to tell you some, something about someone who's in flow all the time. His name's Ren Geyer. He's a toy inventor. I met him when I wrote my book, Timeless Toys, because he invented Twister and Nerf. You may have heard of him. They've sold a couple hundred million copies each, right? So he, he's a toy guy. And that's all I thought he was, was a toy guy, until in 2010, I was working on this documentary film, and I went to interview him. And as I was walking up the stairs with the film crew to see where he did his creative work, on the walls of either side of the stairwell were famous people. Carrie Underwood, Reba McIntyre. I'm like, what's with all the shiny silver record awards, Ren? He goes, oh, my daughter and I formed a music publishing company in the 80s, and we've had some success. I found out later he won a Grammy. They have 46 charted singles. I'm like scratching my head like, what? Never mentioned music. I've known him for 10 years. We go up the steps. There's a box on the shelf. His studio had watercolors and guitars and toy prototypes, and there's this box on the shelf. And I'm like, what's the Sunday system? And he said, well, I have dyslexia. My wife has dyslexia. There's a genetic component to dyslexia. All our kids have it. We hired a reading specialist to work with our kids, and she did such a great job remediating them that we worked with her to form a curriculum. We're in 1,800 schools around the country. It's called the Sunday system. I was like, Ren, you need to write a book. So we worked on this book, Right Brain Red. So the next couple hacks are from this book. Ren contends that if you want to do your best creative work, you need to look outside. So in 1969, I'm going to speed up here because we have 15 minutes, and I'm only halfway through. <laughs> look outside. Ren was working on a game, and him and some engineers were hitting each other in the head with rocks. Sounds crazy, but in the toy industry, it's called playtesting because the rocks in question were made of foam, foam rocks. It was a game called the Caveman Game. It was a stupid game. Ren admitted it. He got hit in the head with a rock and then a big idea. Forget the game. Make it an indoor ball. And he gave the world Nerf. The first Nerf ball in 1969 had a box that said, throw it indoors. You can't damage lamps or break windows. You can't hurt babies or old people. <laughs> Good to know, politically incorrect in 1969. Here's the point. Wren took polyurethane foam that did not exist in the toy industry. It was outside of the toy industry. He brought it inside the toy industry and created a $4 billion brand. Every mass market store in the world. Oh, there we go. Every mass market store in the world has brine shrimp. No, every mass market store in the world has Nerf products. I don't know why it skipped, but yeah, there you go. Um, and there's a lot of toys that do this. A pie company in Connecticut, their workers used to throw the pie plates. That became Frisbee. Brine shrimp 
fall asleep when the water evaporates. They can be in this cyst-like state for 10, 15 years until the water comes back and they spring back to life. A biologist said, I'll make that into a toy. Sea monkeys. Pez is weird. What's better than a toy that gives you candy? Right? Pretend you don't know anything about Pez, and I'm pitching it to you, and you work for a candy company. And I say, you take Mickey Mouse by his head, you push it back, and then out of his larynx, you take a brick, which is kind of like a, a, a vertebrae, and you eat it. What do you think? Never ever work in a million years. It came from outside because it wasn't supposed to be a toy or a candy. It was a smoker's mint. They used cigarette lighter dispensers to dispense the mint. They changed it to Pez. Now, if it only worked in toys, why would you care? It works everywhere. Looking outside works everywhere. This book talks about how uh, Johannes Gutenberg, when he invented the printing press, used screw gears from winemakers and olive oil producers when he created what, before the internet, was the greatest invention in human history, right? Henry Ford, what do we know about him? What did he invent? <coughs> Well, he didn't invent the car, because Carl Benz beat him to that. He invented the modern assembly line, right? He didn't invent it. He was in meat packing plants in Chicago. He saw that the workers were standing still and the product moved. He said, wow, that's way more efficient than having my workers walk from station to station. He reversed it from taking something apart, a cow, to putting something together, a car. And he invented, in air quotes, the modern assembly line, but the idea came from meatpacking plants. Looking outside is powerful. Hack number six is, six is break a rule. It's so cliche, think outside the box. Tons of examples in the toy industry. I'll share one from Twister. Ren invented this game, he pitched it to Milton Bradley and they said, we make board games that you play on a table. That's why we call them tabletop games. This is a mat game you play on the floor, don't want it. Thankfully, they changed their mind. Broke an industry rule. The name of your game should not conjure up images of death and destruction. <laughs> Wren called it Pretzel. They couldn't use that name. They said, we're gonna call it Twister. He grew up in the Midwest and said, Twisters kill people. You can't call it Twister. That's crazy. Broke a societal rule. You should not be that close to someone, especially someone from the opposite sex. Do you notice something about this original game? No kids, all adults. The men are in suits, for crying out loud, with ties. The women have sweaters buttoned to their necks. Why? Because Milton Bradley's competitors accused them of selling, quote, sex in a box. That's what you're trying to sell with this game. It's not going to work. The inventor read and told me, it's real simple. Dirty mind, dirty game. Clean mind, clean game. Simple as that. They sold 40 million copies. And we all, rules are broken all the time. An African American woman could never host her own TV show, much less own her own network. No one wants an electric car. Sorry, uh, Orson Welles, you can't write, direct, produce, and star in your own movie. That'll never happen. No one's going to buy books online. And this is my mom. She's a great rule breaker. The first rule she broke was, did you know in 1942 you couldn't play full court basketball because they thought women would drop dead from exhaustion? It was half court. They can give birth, but if you, give, if you go full court, you'll die. She broke that rule. My favorite mom story is she had a new dress for church, and her mom said, only wear this at church, and don't mess it up because we don't have a lot of money. She was walking home from church. She was a really good athlete. Some boys said, can you please play with us, Helen? We're short, we, we wanna have a baseball game, we don't have enough players, can you please play? And she was like, I don't have time to go home and come back. And she's telling me this story, and I go, what did you do? And she goes, I went two for three with a double. <laughs> yes! So breaking rules can maybe even allow you to do something creative on an equal playing field with others. Number seven, walk. What are these? Companies all have in common. They have started walking meetings. A Stanford study, Stanford University, 2004, did a study on creative people and creative ideation. And people that walk while they're thinking creatively have a 60% increase in creative ideas from people that are seated. Walking meetings is hack number seven. If walk is number seven, then number eight 
is walk away. <laughs> walk away. What does that mean? Take a break. As recently as 30 years ago, the only businesses that were open on Sunday were hospitals. 30 years ago. Now it's Chick-fil-A in hospitals. <laughs> right? They're the only ones that are closed on Sundays. We used to rest, and it was really smart. We don't rest anymore. We average 6.8 hours of sleep a night. A short time ago, it was an hour more. We have all these time-saving time -saving devices and no time. If you want to do your best creative work, you need to take care of you, physically, emotionally, spiritually, all of it, if you want to do your best creative work. And it makes sense, right? So fitness people know, experts in fitness know that when you work out, your muscles grow because they fill up with blood, but you don't get stronger. You get stronger during the recovery time. That's when you get stronger. If you eliminate the recovery time, all the gains that you make go away. Your brain is the same way. You need to take that break. So there's a different aspect to this take a break. I believe strongly in the subconscious. There's a reason <clears throat> why if you're trying to create the next greatest idea, you're not gonna do it while you're sitting there racking your brain trying to create the next great idea. Chances are you're gonna invent the next great idea when you're in the shower or when you're just waking up in the morning or when you're just going to bed. Wren calls it putting the pot on simmer. He, sta he literally states an idea, he speaks it out. Okay, I need to figure out how to do this. Okay, brain, work on it, I'm gonna go play golf. Because he knows I'm not just gonna beat my head against the wall for five hours, I'm gonna go do something else. So take a break. Creativity hack number nine, collaborate, right? I have a chapter in this book with Ren, it's real simple, it makes a lot of sense. We is greater than me. Most of my successes have not been alone. Tribond, game called Blurt, both films, plenty of help. I had a part, plenty of help. Collaboration really works to boost your creativity. There's another way to think about collaboration, competing. So any documentary that you see on the Beatles will tell you that Lennon and, McCar Lennon and McCarthy, McCartney pushed each other. There was one upmanship. Oh, that's a good lyric, but I think I can do a little bit better. Oh, that's pretty good, but I think I can do a little bit better. And they competed as they were collaborating. And that's healthy, and it's great. Do you think that Steve Jobs would get to where he got if Bill Gates never existed? No way. So collaborate, compete is a great way to boost creativity. Here's a great collaboration story. University of Washington, 2008. Some doctors, researchers, biochemists were trying to map a very complicated protein, like a virus, uh, AIDS-like virus. They were trying to map it. Apparently, when you map a, a protein exactly correctly, they can build chemicals, drugs, that bind to it and keep it from replicating. If you know exactly the shape, but it's really hard to map these things because they're complicated. So for 12 years, these scientists, 12 years, trying to figure this thing out, couldn't. Someone said, well, let's try to look at it with computer models. So they founded this website called Folded, where you could solve puzzles for science. And they put it out to the community, and they said, well, we'll just put it out to the gamers of the world, and, and we'll see, you know, we've been working on it for 12 years with no luck, so we'll just put it out there, let them play with it, you know, and, and in a couple weeks, we'll check back and see if anyone came close. This is the actual program, a little clip from it. We'll look in, in a couple weeks and see if anyone came close. In 10 days, a group of gamers solved it. 12 years, biochemists working on it, some outsiders solved it in 10 days. So that is the power of collaboration, the power of looking outside, the power of a new set of eyes. So ask yourself this, is there someone in your community that isn't competing with you directly that you could have a cup of coffee with? and pick their brain and say, what works for you in your business? I know it has nothing to do with my business, but let's sit down and have a cup of coffee and chat because chances are they're doing something that you could bring into your industry and revolutionize it by looking outside and by collaborating. So the final hack, I started with Tribe and I'm gonna end with Tribe on. So, is to serve someone, serve someone. So, this is interesting. Tribe did well after we finished our fateful trade show 
we were in a lot of different countries, a lot of different editions. We had a couple game show pilots produced, that was cool. Sony did a radio game show pilot and a, we had a TV game show pilot, that was cool to go see that filmed, that was really neat. But the high point of Tribot for me was a letter that I got. We sold the company a couple years ago. So remember our first hack, why are you creating? Move others, communicate ideas, solve problems. To be honest with you, when we invented Tribon, we went to the same school as two of the guys from Trivial Pursuit, and we thought, well, they did really well, maybe we should invent a game. That was about as deep as it got. But in the process, remember, creativity is a process, of improving it, it, it became much more of a passion for us. So focus on the whys. We got this letter from a guy who, every Christmas, he would get together with his family, but he wasn't speaking to his dad. They weren't close, they had a falling out. But they got together every year, like a lot of people do, and they played games. One, of the, one year they played Tribon, he wrote us a letter, and he said, my dad and I don't talk, you know, uh, I don't need to go into the reasons why, but we played your game. He laughed. And it was just something in the way he laughed that made me look at him differently. And we got back together. And now we're really close. And thanks for inventing this game. And that's better than any Good Morning America or selling, I mean, that is transcending the reason why you create to move someone, to communicate an important idea like we need each other and to solve a problem. So I'm hoping if there's just one thing that you took away today that you'll be able to take back with you and boost your creativity, then this time will be well worth it. So thanks for having me. Two minutes to go. Whew, that was fast. <laughs> so are there any questions? We have a little time for Q&A. I meant to uh, finish sooner, but hey, there's a lot to cover. I, I did this talk uh, months ago, and I added four new hacks, because I knew the people that heard it needed something new. So <laughs> any questions about toys or anything? Yes. As a writer, well, the, the boundary of space and time is huge. Um, that works for me, and that, that's easier said than done, I know. Interruptions are everywhere. Um, I would suggest, ooh, I'll move this to the next. This might be on your handout, too, but there, here's a bibliography. The Flow Genome Project is a website where they're looking into research with tips on how to you know, try to enter flow. Extreme athletes do it because there's extreme risk. They, ha they almost have to. And I would, to answer your question, I would raise the stakes. You have, to ra you have to make the stakes, why are you creating this? And really ask yourself, why? And if it's important, you're more likely to enter flow. Because remember, the definition is you need to be doing something difficult. You're stretched to your limits in a voluntary effort to do something difficult and worthwhile. And if you don't think it's worthwhile, you'll never enter flow. If it's not difficult enough for you, you'll never enter flow. So you have to raise the stakes. Any other questions? No? Thank you. If you have a P, bring it up and give it back to me, and you can choose a, a toy or a game. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it.